Welcome to another episode of the Animals at Home podcast. Thank you very much for joining me today. I hope that uh, you're enjoying your day and hopefully the weather is starting to warm up wherever you are. Where I am, the snow is finally starting to melt and we're getting a little bit more sunlight throughout the day, which is always a good feeling going into spring. Um, Although I live in a very volatile climate, so we are not out of the woods in terms of getting snow until at least mid-April, so a couple more weeks. If you are someone who has actually been really enjoying the podcast, I do really appreciate that. And one way you can definitely help me out Go to iTunes, the Apple Store, the links are in the show notes for every episode, and give the show a five-star rating and, and leave a review if you are if you are finding the, the podcast entertaining and helpful. That would help me out a lot. The more ratings we can get on that, the better, obviously. And if you want to go to animalsathome.ca slash shop, there are new colors in the sweaters that I have, and you already know that $5 does get donated to the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy. Today, my guest is Jordan Jones. Jordan is the creator of the Instagram account JJ Reptiles World, which is a very popular Instagram account. I think there's about 20,000 followers on her account right now. And she's also the founder and the creator of a product called Repto Rub, which is a topical application, sort of a balm that you can apply to stuck shed for your reptile. So it's really, really interesting. She tells me about how she created it and where it came from and the inspiration behind it and uh, where you can get it and whatnot. Jordan also has a lot of experience working in sort of shelter and vet type scenarios. So we do talk about some of those more problem areas in the hobby. And she is the type of individual that's really doing a lot to what, what you guys know that I'm all about trying to redirect the hobby onto, you know, get it back on the right train tracks, as I do think we've derailed a little bit. And listening to an individual like Jordan talk, th- there are people in the hobby that are doing the right things. And she's not doing it for anything other than the passion that she has for the animals. And, and she has a very deep compassion for them as well, which is very evident uh, as I talk to her. So without anything further, I give you Jordan Jones. Hi, I'm Dylan, and you're listening to the Animals at Home podcast. All right. Jordan, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Well, uh, as I was preparing for this interview, I'm scrolling through your Instagram and whatnot, and it's it's almost difficult to find a good place to start this conversation with you because it seems like you're up to so many different things and you have had so many different jobs related to animals in the past and currently. So I'm excited to get into all of that with you today. Why did you choose to pursue a life surrounded by animals? Um, Honestly, it's one of those things that started when I was really young. I want to say around four or five I was really into animals and my parents thought it was just a phase and uh, they thought I'd grow out of it and silly them because I did not. Um, they tried to steer me in, in different directions and I even went to school for teaching and things like that, but I always went back to the animals. Um, and it wasn't until I was 10 when I started getting into reptiles and I got my first turtle and it just blew up from there. It just took off with it. And then I started getting into other exotic animals. And now I I work with anything that people will give me. I'm just like, Oh, yeah, I'll mess with that. Sure. Okay. So it my heart's always with reptiles, but I do a little bit of everything. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna ask you if if it's I know I because I the, inst- the pictures that you posted yesterday on your Instagram story, there was all sorts of different animals. So I, I, I assumed that you were more of an animal lover in general. So it started with the turtle. And then what, what did you get after that as, as a child uh, with for in terms of pets? Well, I got more turtles. <laughs> the, the turtle... The turtle craze really began. I had like seven or eight at the same time. And then I started getting more into lizards. And I I had to sit down with my mom because she didn't she didn't understand the whole lizard thing. She didn't understand the reptiles and she wanted me to go in different, like more professional (laughs) um, jobs. And I was like, no. So I had to sit down and have a talk with her and be like, Hey, this is really serious. Okay. So I ended up dragging her to the NARBC in Chicago, which is a big reptile expo. All the big reptile breeders are there. And so I made her go with me and she was like, Oh God. And she held her first snake and then she was like, okay, maybe this is okay. And that's actually where I ended up getting my blue iguana. And that's when all the lizard fiascos started. And now I'm, I, I love turtles. I'll always love turtles, but lizards, I'm really into lizards now, right? 
at this moment. <laughs> Do you know why, what gravitated you towards reptiles? Because I mean, a lot of people who listen to the show are reptile lovers and, and think some of us don't even really know why we love them because they are that very weird hobby. And there are people, most people who aren't in reptiles assume that if you're into reptiles, you must be just a strange person. <laughs> or like demonic. Some people That's associate right. that with like Satan. Yeah. Um, I want to say I remember in the fourth grade, I was watching a lot lot of oceanographies and I remember seeing sea turtles. And so I was really, really into sea turtles. And I want to, oh my gosh, I don't really know what caused me to to grasp onto it. But the more I worked on it, the better I got at it. And then I was like, well, this is kind of the only thing I'm really good at. So I need to stay with it and need to do something with this because nothing else is going for me. So I need to, to really focus on the lizard aspect. And, and I don't know, it just, it was one of those things that so, they were so misunderstood. And that was really I guess, captivating because I wanted to figure out why, why are they doing this? Why are they acting like this? And, and just started developing more and more. Have you ever had the opportunity to like snorkel or scuba dive with, with sea turtles? No, that's on my bucket list. I want to do that so bad, but, uh, there was a point where I went to, to scuba class because I was trying to train myself and like get ready for it because for some odd reason, I thought I was going to be doing it here soon. So I was like, well, I'm going to go ahead and get certified for it. And actually during my scuba class, like we would practice in a pool, you know, and like they put all the, the suits on you and you had the big oxygen tank. And I'm not really a big person. Like I'm a pretty petite person. So they put too many weights on me. Oh and um, they were trying to teach me how to manually blow up my BC, like my vest. And so they made me like deflate it. And then I was supposed to sink to the bottom of the pool and then push myself up to, to inflate it. But they put too many weights on me and I couldn't push myself up and I couldn't get my oxygen thing because it was floating yonder. Oh and I, I almost drowned and I freaked out. Um, so I've been scared. I haven't, I didn't go back after that cause I was too paranoid, but it's on my list. I need, I need to do it or I'm just going to hate myself. Yeah. Well, that is a terrifying story. And I'm, <laughs> I, I'm a former swimmer and I am kind of afraid to scuba dive as well because the feeling of being trapped underwater is definitely something that frightens me, but I've actually snorkeled in Maui and I was able to snorkel with these green sea turtles. So you don't, so that's one way to do it. You can, you can, you don't have to actually go underneath the water really. Yeah. And it was incredible. Yeah. It was their size. And this was before I was, was a long time ago, like 10 or 12 years ago. And I was, it was the size of them that really blew me away. Oh yeah. And they're, they're not even the biggest sea turtle. Like, can you imagine being next to the leatherback? I've got to see one in person once. And I thought I was, oh, oh my God. It was, I thought it was the biggest thing I'd ever seen. Yeah, it's incredible how big they get. So as a child, then you decided that, okay, mom is uh, on board with somewhat with the animals. And, <laughs> and then did you, did you have an idea career-wise where you wanted to go? Or you just knew that you wanted to go to school and study animals? Well, Um, My plan was to originally, I had taken a trip a couple years ago to the Georgia Sea Turtle Center on Jekyll Island, and I got to volunteer alongside some biologists, and I got to monitor the beaches with them, and I got to help, uh, I did biopsies on some sea turtles, and I watched uh, a green sea turtle no, I'm sorry. It was a loggerhead lay some eggs and I got to help and measure it. And I was like, Oh my gosh, I, I need to, I want to do more. Um, so my plan was originally to go to probably the university of Atlanta or something like that and try to get into sea turtle biology. Well, I was presented with an opportunity to go to Florida. Like I had a, a job opportunity. So I just went and did that instead. Um, so I didn't get to do that. There's still a part of me that wants to, but I am, in this weird float right now where I want to do a bunch of things. I want to volunteer with different organizations, but I'm also trying to create my own. Um, So I'm in the process of building something either. I think it's going to be in Southern Indiana just because the fish and wildlife laws and regulations are a little bit more flexible over there compared to Kentucky. Um, So I've uh, collaborated with an amazing team of people who all have similar backgrounds to mine and we're trying to 
create this education slash rehabilitation center and kind of work with other outside facilities as well. Um, so like I want, I don't know, I'm everywhere. <laughs> You're being <laughs> pulled in all place. directions. Oh, I want to do it all. Yeah, no, I hear you. Can, can you, I, I, that's really interesting that, that rehab center. So is that, that's obviously something that's just in the very preliminary, uh, stages clearly is that yeah. so is that it would be kind of like a, a place where people can come and, and learn about animals that are currently being rehabilitated and so not not a zoo but but something like that where people can still interact with them yeah absolutely i think interaction is key it, it helps people you know get rid of their fears and their insecurities and it makes them more comfortable and it helps you also remember that experience as well, because you can teach a kid and you can talk to them and lecture them. But if you actually have them engaged and actually like affiliating with the animal, then they're never going to forget it. So I think the interaction part is definitely it has to happen or I'm not going to be happy with it. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it for sure does something totally different to the memory when you have even even if you're not touching them, at least being able to see them there in person, it, it makes a huge difference. So in terms of the, the jobs that you've had previously, I know, I think, have you worked in a, a, a vet or you look like you were doing some rehab type work before? Yeah. Uh, so I know I currently work alongside a veterinarian. Um, when I lived in Florida, I worked with a couple of vets as well. Um, I had the opportunity to be a part of Crow Wildlife, which they're located on Sanibel Island. And they just, um, they mainly do uh, the rehab of indigenous Wildlife, so you know you have your invasive, and they don't really take care of that part of it. I mean, they'll safely euthanize it and humanely do it, but they focus on a lot of. Um, they, we got to focus on sea turtles, which was exciting. Um, a lot of birds, which I'm not. Birds aren't my strong point, but I learned a lot, and I'm trying to get over the whole. Because <laughs> <laughs> they got these big claws, and I'm like, please don't take me away. <laughs> And um, so in like gopher tortoises, that's where I was mainly. I did a lot of rehabilitating with the gopher tortoises and some, we didn't get as many reptiles as I would have liked, but we got a lot of different types of species and it was, it was incredible. And it made me learn a lot more than I thought I knew. Yeah, definitely working with the hands-on animals makes it, makes a total difference. Do you have a, out of these experiences with kind of working with the vet, is there a, do you have a favorite animal experience? Um, well, I mean, it's, hmm, it's kind of like a, a learning experience. I wouldn't say it's my favorite. It, it's my favorite to tell, but it wasn't my favorite when it was happening. Um, so I was working alongside a vet and we had a very old, and this was just a cat. It wasn't anything fancy, but we had a very old cat and we needed to do a butterfly catheter on it. And I'm not a fan of needles. Needles have always been something that just, it's touch and go. Like I can get tattoos and I'm fine, but just like a, a flu shot, I, I, I run. And so I was assisting this doctor trying to put in this butterfly catheter and somehow my legs buckled and I ended up just passing out in the middle of the hospital. <laughs> and uh, I woke up to like a can of Sprite and some Smarties. So that was pretty cool. But I, I learned, I learned a lot that maybe, you know, don't buckle your legs and to just pay attention and relax because I've never passed out before and it just, there I went and I was like, oh my gosh. So now whenever, like at my current job, I just have to take things really slow and I have to be like, okay, we're getting out some needles. That's okay. Like I, I, both my feet are on the ground. <laughs> Everything's good. Get some Sprite though, just in case. But it, it's one of those, I think it's funny now. It wasn't funny then, um, but it's definitely, I learned a lot from that experience. <laughs> yeah, and I hear that, like I have a lot of friends who are in the in the medical industry and my fiance is a nurse and, and that happens a lot actually. And it's always out of the blue. People don't even think they have a problem with needles and all of a sudden they wake up on the floor and they're like, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> How did I get here? Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> so now you got to just take it, take it easy, pull the needles yeah. out, take some deep breaths. So, so right now yeah. with the job you currently have with the vet can you just just describe like a sort of an everyday type uh oh goodness it's well, different it's every kinda, day <laughs> it's kind of different um I mean people it, it's uh, I want to say that nothing surprises me but I really do encounter a lot of uh 
a lot of different surprises. I like for yesterday, it was our long day. So we're there basically 13 hours the whole time. And I mean, I do a lot of like, I'll do assisting, I'll do some teching, I'll answer phones, book appointments. So like, there's a little bit of everything that kind of goes on there. And I did have this lady come in saying her dog um, ate some, some little toys. And I was like, what kind of toys? <laughs> and she was like, oh, little farm animal toys, like from like, a, I guess a Fisher Price farm thing. I don't know, but, but um, the dog couldn't throw it up and he wasn't releasing it any other way and we we did like an x-ray and ultrasound and we saw the little horse just oh, like no. lodged in there and i'm like oh there we are <laughs> so it's kind of different but it, it's it's very great and it's a constant learning experience yeah i bet and you know the working either as a vet or in a vet as a, as a tech or, or whatnot is always one of the things that's on a child's list of things they might want to get into if they're an animal lover. So I, I know for me it was as well until I looked into it a little bit deeper and I thought, wow, I don't know if I can be in that medical environment because you're dealing with a lot of sad stories. Is is there one thing that you wish you knew before going in or if, if like a piece of advice that if somebody was thinking of going into that direction, uh, a piece of advice you might give them? Um, a good piece of advice would be don't overthink it, but also like, it's okay to be empathetic. Um, I'm extremely empathetic. So empathetic, I can feel when a needle is going in somebody else, I can feel it myself. <laughs> it's okay to be empathetic. It's okay to cry. Um, you're going to get attached to other people's animals, but you have to understand that when it's time to go, it's time to go. And a lot of people, when they think about the veterinarian field, they think, oh, you're just playing with animals all day and you're making them feel better. But they don't really think that you're also having to say goodbye a lot. And so that's something I like to, to bring forward and bring to light um, to just keep in mind about that. It happens. It's OK to to feel sadness um, and um also contact like a local vet near you and see if you can shadow. I know the clinic I work for, we let people shadow all the time. So if it's something you kind of want to see, ask, go see if they'll let you shadow for a day so you can kind of get a, a feel for what goes on behind the scenes. Yeah, exactly. Cause as it, when you're not in it, you don't really know like, what is this going to be like? But it's, uh, I imagine there are obviously huge positives to it as well. There, the, there, are, I think the, the way you said it when it's, it's time to go or I can't, how did you phrase that? It, it, it works well, you know, some, not everybody is going to make it through the day and you're doing yeah. your best. Yeah. When it's time to say goodbye, it's time to say goodbye. And it's just, it sucks, but it, it's, it's kind of like, no matter what you do in the animal industry, you're going to encounter it. Um, it's just with the vet field, you're going to encounter it like every day. <laughs> yeah. And so the one thing with reptiles is I know I read this stat in, in one of these academic papers that I had read this year that said the reason that reptiles are brought to the vet most often is just due to poor husbandry. Is that something that you can relate to? Yeah. Um, any case I've typically seen has been respiratory um, related. So temperature wise, um, especially aquatic turtles, I see that very very often uh, they'll come in with a RI, which is, it can be fatal if not treated properly. So I always tell people, Hey, and I like to even talk about it on Instagram from time to time, like friendly reminder, make sure your, your temperatures and your water is at least over 77 degrees just to avoid the RI. And if it's in the early stages of it, you know, be aware of, of the warning signs of like floating and bubbles coming from the nose, just dry dock them, crank up the temperature. It'll kind of, it's like a fever, you know, you want to create the fever so they fight it. Um, but if it's too severe, then you need to definitely get them into a vet so they can be given antibiotics. Yeah. And that's, that's one of the things I talk about all the time is just, you need to be very aware. If you have too many animals, you might start losing the ability to, to judge how they're doing. And so when you yeah. have enough where you can pay attention to them, you know when something's a little bit off and respiratory infections are a great example because quite often they can actually cure themselves. Like just like you said, yeah. making sure you're putting them in a condition where they can just let their body do do the work, but you, you need to catch it on time. Yeah, it's like if you know the warning signs, it's going to be pretty obvious and then it's easier to treat and less expensive. But, you know, if you're not paying attention and you have too many animals going on, it's very easy to let that kind of thing slip through the cracks. Yeah, no, definitely. How many animals do you have right now? 
I want to say I I only have I think eight. Okay, that's not too bad. Uh, seven or eight right now, just because my space is limited. But over time, I'll definitely probably get some extra critters. It's just I have to have the space for it. I want to do it right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, we don't want to get into the stacking a bunch of animals into one room. What sort of animals do you have right now? Um, okay. I have, well, everyone knows Giles, my blue iguana. Um, he's, he's the one with the biggest personality. So a lot of people recognize him. Um, and then I have, I just adopted out a red iguana that I had. Um, I was rehabilitating her. So she's, she just left about two weeks ago. So I no longer have her. And I have my African bullfrog. I have my Moroccan Euromastix. I have, oh my goodness. Uh, I have, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> no um, I have my Savannah monitor. Um, my, my monitor, I also have a, a tortoise, a cicada tortoise. They don't live with me right now. Uh, my boyfriend, he lives in Illinois. He's actually babysitting them for me. So I'm like, wait a second, wait a second. Because <laughs> I was like, they're not here, but they're still mine. Um, and then I have like some cats. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I saw that you had bought a... Uh... Jungle, or what do you call those, a cat tree just, or whatever? <laughs> I just called it a, a big cat tree, and they love it. They're all over it. I bet they do. <laughs> do they tear apart your furniture, or does the tree help them uh, thwart some of that? Well, uh, the tree has been helping because it has some built-in, like, scratching posts, but they keep uh, scratching up, like, the side of my mattress, and then uh, one of my kittens, she keeps biting my feet, and... I'm like, girl, so I'm hoping this will kind of get her off my toes and on there. But, I mean, they've been very, very occupied with that thing. Very good. So, you obviously, the, the vet part is the, uh, the day job. And you have some other things going on as well. I know that you have a reptile educating business. Oh, yeah. <laughs> can you describe just a little bit about what that is? And, and or I guess let, let, maybe start with why you started it. And then we can chat about what it is. Okay. Well, it kind of goes back to how I was raised with the whole reptile thing. And my parents wanted me to go in a different direction because in Kentucky, you don't really have those sources. You don't have like, there's an aquarium, but you have, at least I'm in Louisville. So I'm in the city part and the nearest aquarium is about almost two hours away. Um, I am really close to the local zoo, but it's kind of hard to get in with them. Um, so like the resources here are not as frequent. And so I wanted to create something that more people would have access to that is you don't have to have so many years of experience or 20 different degrees and all that stuff just to get to volunteer for a week you know it can be anybody of any age um, so I wanted to create a program um, for anybody local who have kids or students really interested in the science aspect even just stem in general um, animals ecology things like that and so I offer you know presentations I can let them come meet my animals interact with them I also um, am a vendor at the local uh, reptile expo so kids come up all the time and they pet Giles they pet my Euromastix they ask a thousand questions and and I just give as much advice as possible and kind of invite them along to anything they would want to see or do Oh, very cool. So do you go into like some sort of school type settings and just give those those lectures? Yeah. So I've had a couple teachers reach out to me and I'll uh, coordinate some things like what are what are, you know, some things you guys have been learning in the classroom. Maybe I can kind of like piggyback off that to kind of support whatever you guys are learning. Or if they're just like, no, bring everything you have. And I'm like, OK, here we come. And I'll just bring my whole gang and I'll do some presentations. Uh, we'll do some fun projects. I know I had some students. We made turtle shells. And they got to decorate it. And then on the plastron of all the shells, um, I wrote down like turtle facts, you know, what to do when you see one crossing the road, things like that. Because not everybody in Kentucky lives in the city part. Like some are in the country and they'll probably run into turtles crossing the road more than I would. So I think it's really important for them to, mom, dad, pull over, put your flashers on. This is what we're going to do because I saw it on the back of this turtle shell. <laughs> so just things like that. No, that's awesome. I think anybody that is doing something similar, doing any sort of lecture and education, everybody I've talked to says the same thing, that teaching things to the kids is easily the most rewarding part of their day. Oh, absolutely. It's so much better than the adults, for sure. 
they just like it more. Yeah. And they're, they're so excited. And the adults, you know, you kind of have to push them a little bit like, Oh, come on, come on. And then they're like, okay, okay, okay. But you know, they're more, they're more closed and guarded than the kids are. And it is cool if you can encourage them to look at the native wildlife as well, right? Because then they can oh, kind of yeah. go it on their own and, and learn things that are in their backyard type thing. Yeah, they can point it out and they can know, you know, what's venomous, what you need to like chill out on. Because a lot of people will see a snake, they'll kill it and then take a picture and be like, was this venomous? No, it wasn't. <laughs> but there you go. <laughs> yeah, you killed it. Good job. <laughs> like, okay, let's look. What did we learn here? So it kind of helps so people can kind of relax what they see in their backyards. Is one of your animals the most popular of, amongst the kids, or does every kid sort of have a different one that they gravitate towards? Mm, the majority of kids love Giles just because he's blue and he's big. But there's always a couple of students that kind of pick out the tortoise or or they like the snakes or or they like, you know, my Euromastic. So the majority rule for Giles, but there's always a few that are like, but I like that one. Can I hold that one? There you go. <laughs> yeah, the, the blue iguana is always such a impressive. It's just just the color looks so strange, to, I think, to most people. It's very like beautiful to see. Yeah, it's very um, captivating. Yes, that's a good word to well, put. People want to know, like, what is that? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very cool. And uh, I, I know that on Instagram you have there's that one little video that you have of your, I think you're just kind of pretending to read to him, that lizard book, and, and then he kind of gives you a tail smack. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh that uh I, I was living in florida and i like to take him on car rides with me he usually sits on my dashboard and i just i really wanted a sandwich and so we just went to the local fast food place to to get a sandwich and they saw him and they were freaking out and the manager um asked for my instagram name so i gave it to her and, and she was like you know we do a lot of things with the community would you be interested in like reading some reptile related books to the kids and i'm like yeah i've never done that before okay so I ordered some reptile books to test it out because I wanted to see how this would go. And I'd rather test it out in my house than in the middle of a restaurant in front of a bunch of kids that are probably nervous. So I just tested it out and I, I had a feeling something was going to happen. So that's why I recorded it because Giles always does something. So I was like, okay, this is going to be good. And he didn't fail. He smacked the snot out of that book and then smacked it again. Yeah. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> if anyone hasn't seen it, you got to go check out Jordan's Instagram. Everything will be in the show notes so you can go see it because it, it literally is like a meme almost. <laughs> it really is. I was like, oh my gosh, what is, what is, uh, I just wanted to read to the kids, but it, you know, it, he said no. So yes. that was that. <laughs> so you put a plug, no, no, pulled the plug on that one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, now, now Reginald Hopper, my, my bullfrog, he did really well because he didn't move. So if anybody needs a frog to read a book, like, I got you. But Giles, he can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough. He's not fair available. Enough. <laughs> I know one of the things that you have done the lectures on, I think maybe a year ago, I saw you had a, a post on this about the importance of reptile so, uh, socialization. Mm -hmm. can, can you talk yeah. a little bit about that? Yeah, so... Um, here in Kentucky, we have a Kentucky Herpetological Society, and I've been a part of it, and I have a lot of good friends, and I'm really good friends with the president, and um, the president reached out to me last year, and he asked if I would do a presentation presentation and I was like are you sure like I don't really do presentations for adults like okay I'll give it a shot and so I made this PowerPoint and, and I brought my animals and I let Giles and I think I had brought my Euromastics and I let them just walk across people as I was talking and I was explaining how you know if I wouldn't have socialized him he would be beating up every single person in this room and it also goes back to trying to, to do presentations for students. I'm not going to put students in dangerous situations. And if my iguana wasn't, you know, relaxed or anything, then this would be dangerous not only for me and the animal, but all of those kids as well. So just having the socialization aspect, I think, is almost mandatory when you're owning reptiles and um, more specifically iguanas but in rip reptiles in general it helps i think it helps with the enrichment process as well because then you can hide food in certain little doodads and gadgets and 
but you want to safely be able to do that. If they're too aggressive and you can't get in there to do the enrichment, then nobody wins in this situation. So I think it's important to form those bonds, form that trust. That way you can introduce more opportunities to them and be able to do presentations if you wanted to. Yeah, it's an interesting concept because I think reptiles are actually a lot more intelligent, especially some of the larger species are than we might think. And I've, I've always kind of swung both directions on this. And I have boas and I am i don't handle them a ton, but I, I do handle them because it's one its one of my animals that I want to make sure that I can trust. when I Because people want to hold it, they want to touch it. I want to make sure that this you know six foot snake is not going to be an issue. I, I mean, typically it's the animal that's going to get hurt in a situation as well. Like somebody might get bit, but then you don't know how the person's going to respond. And, and then I have two little geckos who I don't handle at all. And I kind of think like, well, I don't really need to handle them, but it, you almost have to, if you're, if you're going to commit to not handling something like a gecko, you just can never do it. And I literally never handle them. One's a day gecko, so you shouldn't really be handling them anyway. And, but, but you don't want to be that type of person that doesn't socialize them and then just pulls them out at a party and makes the animal go probably, you know, a thousand beats per minute stress level just because they're never handled. So you kind of have to choose what you end up doing almost. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, even when you apply too much stress, they can get sick and then you have a vet bill (laughs) and and even trying to get them to the vet that can cause more stress. So it's either you're in or you're out. You got to you got to choose which way you're going to do it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And if it is a bigger animal like an iguana or a boa or something, it's obviously you probably want to err on the side of socializing them and getting them used to or habituated to, to human handling. And that's actually a good point because one of my crested gecko actually like maybe a month ago had a swollen vent and I wasn't sure what the deal was with that. I hadn't seen him. He's 15, so he's an old guy. And I literally have never handled him because when I got him, he was already two or three years old and I, I never handled him or he was never handled and I just left it like that. And then I'm left with this, like, I can't take him to the vet. Like, taking him to the vet could kill him because he's not used to being handled. He's not going to be, he's not going to take a car ride. Uh, So you get to that point where I kind of wish I had been handling him so I could have taken him to the vet. And luckily it cleared up and it was all fine. And I just was fortunate in this case. But that would be an example of, you know, potentially handling would have been better. Yeah. But, I mean, it's also one of those things where some people might not feel comfortable enough to do it like they want that animal and it, it's very controversial um but i it, uh, it's just all up to the people how they want to handle it um just because i do a lot of education with mine i have to interact with them and it's not only that but i want to i like forming bonds because my iguana has separation anxiety now and if i leave the room or like if i'm doing a presentation and i'm holding him and then i hand him off to somebody else and i leave he loses his mind so i'm that i'm that safe haven i'm mom he trusts me so it's if i have a medical issue that i can't treat personally i can go transport him without an issue so like it, it's just all up to how somebody likes to go about it. Yeah, and and there's some animals are just more social. Like I've talked to several people who who have iguanas or breed iguanas, and that's one of the things that they love about them is how social they are. The reptiles seem to recognize you, obviously, and and they come to you. And not every reptile is like that, but for sure, the ones that are socializing in the wild with their own species probably benefit from socializing with uh, their owner. Yeah, absolutely. Because obviously, we all know ill-behaved iguanas uh, can be quite sketchy. Oh yeah, and quite dangerous. And uh, you can you, then you have to go to the doctor because you know you got bit, and now you got to get stitches. So it's just easier to kind of interact with them. They make everybody safer. Exactly, and I I do love what you said about the enrichment because that's one thing that I really try to push uh, through the content that I produce is trying to enrich the animal's environment in some way. So, you know, climbing branches or natural substrate, but I really like the uh, hiding the food idea. Do you do that with your monitor? Oh, <laughs> well, unfortunately, like he he's very special. So I got him from like a, a bad situation. So he has like metabolic bone disease. He has 
oh my goodness, he has a neurological dis disorder. So he walks like this and he's just naturally slow. So I can't really do too much because everything's already a, a struggle and it's a fun game to see if he can do it. Um, but Giles, I will hide. He loves blueberries. So I'll hide them under all of his greens or I'll hide them in a toy or I'll hide it under like a bowl or something. And he, when he sees it, he's like, oh my gosh. So it, it's really funny and it's exciting for him because it's it's off routine and it just provides that extra wheel turn in his head like how can I get this berry <laughs> yeah exactly and it is uh, there are people that say it's not important but it for sure is I mean there's enough studies to show that these reptiles do have some kind of uh, you know basic learning abilities especially you see it in tortoises and monitors for sure there's plenty of studies that show that and you know the what I always kind of beat on is the the industrial breeding operations that we have in, in the United States and Canada that I just don't see as beneficial for the animals. You have these, you know, plain tubs and whatnot. And, and you can imagine that these animals could go out and explore for food and, and they could be enriched, but instead they're just sitting there. And the mental acuity between an animal that's enriched and one that's sitting in a tub must be completely different. Oh, yeah. They have totally different thought processes and they're just, ah, uh, it's, it's kind of sad, but if, you know, if you get to have one of those animals that were just in a bin or something, then it's rewarding for them and for you because then they're kind of exposed to this whole new world of not just being stuck in a tub. Um, now, I do know like some people personally who have animals in a tub, but they get them out all the time. And like, that's fine. I understand. I like the naturalistic um Oh my goodness, I lost my words. I like the naturalistic setups personally, but I think as long as you're getting it, them out and interacting in some way and there's some enrichment in there, then that's fine as well. Yeah, you, you do need something. And for me, the, for the most rewarding part about owning the animals is watching them behave naturally. Like, I love that. That's why I got into the hobby. Not everybody's the same, but for me, it's like, you know, turning on Animal Planet in my room because I can yeah. watch them do what they would be doing in the wild. And if you don't give them the opportunity, then they will just kind of sit there and like a bump on a log and do nothing. <laughs> yeah. And that's no fun for anybody. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure you've seen, I don't want to bring the energy down too much, but I'm sure you've seen some like horror stories in terms of people bringing in animals and with metabolic bone disease or, or something like that. Do you have any sad stories that maybe end happily? that end happily they don't have to end it happily but okay. but I, I think it's also good <laughs> <clears throat> it's also good for people to hear some of the horror stories just just because we need to take some responsibility for the hobby as well and and any of those kind of yeah. sad stories should be out there mm -hmm. so the majority of cases that i deal with personally are all people who impulse buy and they don't really think through about the enclosure size or, or you know, their needs, the lighting, temperatures, any of that fun stuff. Um, so a good example would be probably this red iguana that had just rehabilitated. Uh, she, or actually found out it was a boy, found out the hard way, <laughs> like not that long ago. He, um, he, oh my goodness, he had a broken tail. He had broken fingers. He had a calcium deficiency, um, he, and he had so many layers of stuck shed that there was infection developing, and uh, it, it, another week or two, that lizard would have been gone, and so I was like, you know, I'm just going to take that, thank you, and I instantly soaked him and was trying to get results, and then like his fingers started falling off, and I was like, oh my god, and then his tail was just totally dried to a crisp, you know, and so like that fell off, and uh, and then that's that's how a lot of a lot of things developed from this one case. So it started off sad, but it's actually the reason why like Riptorub got developed was because of this lizard as well. Um, because in order to treat infection, it's best to treat it directly. And when you can't do that with several layers of dead skin, it makes it ten times harder to treat. And so I was using a bunch of de shedding formulas and it, nothing was working. And I'm not really a patient person when it comes to the medical field and trying to, to get everybody healthy. So I was like, I need to do something about this. This is driving me bonkers. So I ended up coming up with a bunch of 
ingredients that I know I use for my skin that's healthy for you and things you can find in your cabinet. And then I started kind of testing that out. And when it worked, I was like, oh, crap, what, <laughs> what, what have I, I created? <laughs> like, this is great, but like, hang on. And um, I started, I had her on antibiotics and we were getting calcium shots and oh, it's a him, <laughs> getting him calcium shots and um, just uh, we did a lot of syringe feed and uh, he finally, you know, like the fingers are gone. That's fine. The tail is slowly growing back, but he's fat and happy and healthy. And now he's with his new mom. So happy. Very good. <laughs> happy so w- were the, were the bones breaking just because of metabolic bone disease? Like he was so, like nothing, no trauma or anything. It was just poor diet basically, or, or no like um, UVB or something. It was a mixture of metabolic bone disease and the stuck shed. So the bones were becoming fragile due the, to the lack of the UVB and calcium in general. And then the, the layers of shed was just wrapping around, helping cut off circulation. And they just popped on off. And I was like, that's pretty gross. <laughs> uh, did you find them just in the enclosure or something? Yeah. The uh, one, one came off while I was soaking him. And I was uh, like, that can go in the trash. <laughs> yep. Like, ugh. It's yeah. the thing that amazes me is how much a reptile can live through. They are like the most rugged things on the planet because, because the species, it doesn't make sense that that thing survived. It, it doesn't. And yeah, what a trooper. I don't know. I mean, everything happens for a reason and I think I was in the right place at the right time, but I think given a couple more weeks, that little boy wouldn't have been there anymore. And who knows? if the person just would have gotten another one and then just the, the process keeps going. So yeah, there was no, there was no UVB. Uh, I know that they were just feeding strictly uh, iceberg lettuce and, um, and like weird items. What was it that they were doing? It was, they were giving them like oatmeal and I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> so like that was not doing it. And then, you know, there also the heat was extremely low and you need to have right heat so they could digest properly. So of course that wasn't forming an appetite. And even if the lizard did try to eat, like, you know, it just wouldn't digest. It, it was just a recipe for a disaster. And I kind of let them know like, hey, stop. <laughs> like let me let me tell you all the things you need to do that way if you do decide to get another one you can do it right and i don't have to come bother you again <laughs> yeah oatmeal is not the uh not on the care sheet <laughs> no not for anybody's care sheet no <laughs> throw that care sheet out if you see it <laughs> yeah exactly and that is one of the i think the cruxes of the issue is that these people I don't want to blame the people that are buying them because like you said, it's a lot of impulse purchases and whatnot. Sorry. Whenever I, on Tuesdays, I always do this row, uh, like a row workout and it always gives me like asthma for the whole day. (laughs) (laughs) So I kind of lose my voice. I don't know why I keep scheduling uh, podcasts on the day I row, but, um, (laughs) but these, it's amazing how easily it is to go impulse buy an animal and they're being bred at these mass scales. And every time I see a breeding operation, I just wonder, like, I don't know that many people with reptiles. Who's buying these? Yeah. But, but people are buying them. They're just not making it more than a year, typically. And it's just this, like, cycle. So I, how do we, is there a way to address that? I would say, oh, my goodness. I know. I mean, It's a there's, big problem. Uh, there's only so much like someone individually can do. I know from my standpoint, education, like that's when I I use my platform to kind of talk about those things and let people know, hey, this is what you need to look for. Like there's a way to go to an expo and see if an animal is healthy instead of just getting it because you're really into it because it's pretty or, oh, it'll look cool and I can take a picture with it once and that'll be that. Um, You can actually tell right there and then if this animal is healthy and if that breeder is is credible. And if they're not credible, then that's something you need to talk to them about and kind of see behind the scenes, like how are they doing things? Because I know good breeders and I know bad breeders too. So it's kind of like, well, some of them are really good. Like I know it's some people are really nervous about it because they see a mass production and they think, oh, they're just in it for the money. But there's actually a good amount of breeders that that care about them and try to to educate people before they buy it. And then there's the people who just want the money. And 
those are the people that you typically see the most of, unfortunately. Um, and it's the ones you kind of just want to steer away from. Or if you're pretty, you know, mouthy, you can go confront them about it. But that's, I just, mm, it's hard to individually try to fix it. It, it is, yeah. And, and it's more of a culture that needs to change. And I think what you're up to is obviously beneficial. Like you have a giant social media platform and you can kind of educate people. And then obviously you have plans for building that center in the future. And that sort of thing, I think, is what will eventually kind of pull the hobby back on the right track. Um, so so that's very cool. I wanted to jump back to, to ReptoRub because I think this is a really interesting it's just cool thing. So obviously with the with the red iguana rehab, that's where it came from. Um, what sort of things were you just like mad scientists throwing into a pot to to try to make this? I guess because because the goal was to pull shed off, right? Yes, that's that's the main goal. I know I was mainly going after severe stuck shed, but I learned that even like little basic toe sheds, they'll come right off. Um, but I kind of put I put about seven or eight ingredients because I was trying to attack layers of just, oh my gosh, at least this lizard had eight layers of dead skin. Like it was hard as a rock. You could have slicked it. <laughs> like, That's it crazy. Was, it was rough. So um, I, I'm in the process of getting a patent for it. So I can't release all of the ingredients oh, just okay. yet, but it has things like aloe, which is really good for your skin. Um, it has like beeswax as well. Um, and then it has honey, which is like nature's natural band-aid. So I wanted honey into the mix because, you know, sometimes when the shed is so bad and stuck to their skin, there can kind of be a little boo-boo or, you know, a little mark or even like some of the scales might come off. So that honey kind of helps not only remove the shed, but help the skin as well. Um, but I made it. It's not like aggressive, but I made it to really, really attack a lot of layers. So the more you use it, the more layers that will come off. Um, I typically tell people if you just have some sto some toe shed going on, just use it once a week, please. <laughs> Don't use it more than that because you're it's it's designed to lock in moisture like crazy. And if you lock in too much moisture, you know the skin does needs air to breathe, and you're kind of keeping the air the the skin from doing that. And then over time, it can make the the skin too moist and can cause issues. Shoes. So I always tell people like, please don't overuse this or anything like that. And don't put it on your amphibians. Like this is designed, you wouldn't believe. <laughs> I have to put a disclaimer on there. Like, please, please don't put it on your frog. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, your frog does not need this. <laughs> put them in water. <laughs> so are people using it for maintenance as well as like treating stuck shed or kind of both things? Yeah. So, so for both, um, I've had people with severe cases contact me and then I've had people who just have like little flakes, just little spots that are annoying or some, some people if like, if they have a large platform, then people, followers have pointed it out and they're like, what's that? What's that? It's a piece of skin. It's okay. It's going to come off. So like little, little things, you know, if, if your dragon is having issues getting parts of the tail shed off, like this would help that or, just little spots on the back or on the, like, I know the eyelids, like with the iguanas, they like to get it stuck right there or even on the top of the head that you just put a little part on there and it should be off within a week, but don't over apply it and you should have the results you want. I haven't had anybody say it didn't work for them. Not so basically, <laughs> yeah. So basically it's just a, a bit like a bomb essentially that you apply directly to the animal and then it'll eventually pull the skin or dried skin off. Yeah. So I know th this is also another controversial topic with people who assist their lizards shedding or their snake shedding, things like that. And as long as the skin is like not attached to the main scales, you can just take that right on off. And with the, the Ripto Rub, um, you know, I always tell people soak your lizard or your snake um, at least for 15 minutes, kind of let those pores open up and then you take them out, kind of do like a dry pat because the moisture, the water does help, but you, they don't need to be drenched. And then you just take the, it's like a lotion consistency and you just rub it in until it's clear. Um, and it's going to lock in the moisture and then it should just fall off. Or if you see it's just there and you kind of rub it, it should just rub right off as well. Um, so it's 
all natural. I've had people message me because their lizard licked it and they're like, is something going to happen? And I'm like, no, if it's just a lick, it's just a lick. Don't let them consume it or it's going to act as nature's laxative. But that's about it. <laughs> like, It's not going to it's. It's like as if we ingested it, you know, I use it for my skin occasionally because it's cold here and your skin gets dry. So like I'll use it on my skin too. So it's just one of those things where it's beneficial. If you want to be like your pet, some people dress their pets the same or they, you know, resemble, do the same haircuts. Well, y'all can have the same like moisturizing routine as well. There you go. You can have the same <laughs> facial products. <laughs> That is really cool. It's a really innovative idea, and uh, and I think you already are selling it. The patent aside, like you you are selling it, and you're just sort of waiting for a patent to I, come through. Yeah, I, I'm selling it. I haven't been promoting it like crazy just yet, just because I am waiting for that patent. Uh, patents are not cheap, so I'm saving up money that way. Whenever I do, I know my logo is trademarked. I have that. That's in the bag. But I haven't been able to release all of the ingredients. And I know that's something people are like, but what's in it? What's in it? And I'm just like, I promise it's safe. I'll tell you later. I can't tell you right now because I don't need anybody trying to take this right now. <laughs> well, good for you for doing that because I the patents are very difficult. to. They're a long process. And even a trademark can be kind of a lot of paperwork as well. So and it's expensive. So but I, I'm sure it will pay off because it's definitely a product that, especially because it's natural, people like that. And and if you are dealing, especially in those rehab situations where people are getting animals in with more than one layer of stuck shed, it can be impossible to pull them off. Yeah. And a lot of people just go for it and try to pull it off and then they run into a lot more issues. And I'm like, wow, don't do that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now we got to treat this as well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Awesome. Well, I, I want to just wrap up here. We're almost uh, at the hour. So I really in, have enjoyed everything that you've had to say so far. Do you, do you know where that compassion comes from? Like, because you, you're taking on a role that's a little more than the average person that's in that sort of hobby or, or animal industry. It seems like you really do care and you're, you're almost wanting to help every animal that you can come in contact with if, if they're sick. How come? Well, it's a blessing and a curse. Um, it's one of those things where you want to save them all, but you can't, and you have to think responsibly if, you know, if you take all these animals, like, okay, good. You got them out of that situation, but now you've over applied yourself and now you don't have the right resources to take care of it. So it's a blessing because I, I know what to do to kind of fix things, but it's a curse because I want to do it to everybody, but I can't, um, I want to say, I typically, I think about whenever I was a kid, whenever I started um, getting into reptiles and I had my first turtle when I was 10, I didn't have anybody to kind of look up to. Uh, the internet surprisingly wasn't a big thing back in the day. Like it was what, 2000, 2004, 2003. <laughs> the internet wasn't really that big of a thing. And um, I didn't have anybody to look up to and I didn't have the internet or anything like that. So I kind of, always whenever especially when I'm doing a presentation I act like I'm talking to a 10 year old me and I, I try to like push that not push that on them but I try to inspire them and kind of create a spark because like <laughs> this it needs to keep going it can't die off because the next generation is going to be responsible for basically fixing everything that's been going on here like I can't just do it this generation enough like there's not enough of us so we got to keep it going that way we can keep the animals that we have and maybe try to I know scientists are working on all kinds of crazy stuff trying to bring things back and they're recently rediscovering things they thought was extinct and you know just overall we need to protect the environment and protect the animals that we have um I, I don't know why I'm the way that I am. <laughs> That's a really deep question now that I'm hearing you say it back. <laughs> Why are you like this? I don't know. But yeah. I, I'm glad. And, and I'm glad that I also work alongside like-minded people. And I think it's important to surround yourself with like-minded people as well, because you guys work together and you push each other. And I think that can, you can only go up from there. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think you're totally right. You can kind of attack the issue on, on a two tiered approach where one, you're going to do what you can when you come in contact with an animal. Of course, you can't help every animal, but you can also educate people and encourage people to maybe want to do the same. Because I'm guessing if you went on your local classifieds, you probably have a hard time 
like looking because because local classifieds are full of the worst situations typically and for me like i i am probably not as compassionate because when i when i see an animal i feel terrible for it but the my first instinct is not to like bring it home just because i know how much work it is and and of course you want to save every animal but i think educating the public around it is is really the best way to do it yeah it's worth a shot <laughs> definitely <laughs> Absolutely. Very cool. Well, uh, I really appreciate you coming on. Can you let everybody know where they can find everything there is to know about you uh, on the internet that does exist now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so you can find me on Instagram. It's JJ's Reptile World. And then I do have a Facebook page that's called a JJ Reptile Educator. Um, I mainly post on Instagram, though. That's where you can find the link to Reptile Rub. And that's where you can find access to all of the crazy videos and all of the fun facts. Mm -hmm. And has your has your Instagram page grown quite a lot within the last uh, couple of years or has it just done a spike just recently? Um, I want to say th through the past six months, it went up a couple thousand. And but it, I think it was because of that silly book video. Like that one went pretty good. Uh, that, that caused a couple thousand to show up. And I was like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> um, but it's I've had this account for about four years. So it just every year, just just more and more kind of realize who I am. And I'm like, hey. I'm here. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's awesome because I, I like talking to people like you because you are promoting the right message in the hobby. So keep doing what you're doing. I, re I really appreciated talking to you and uh, and we'll potentially catch up into the future and, and make sure that everybody's following you on Instagram. I'll have all the, uh, the show notes with the links <laughs> to everything. Well, awesome. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. And somehow we have found ourselves at the end of another episode. Thank you so much for listening to the show. I hope you enjoyed that one. I really enjoyed the stories that Jordan shared and you can just tell that this is a very compassionate individual uh, even at the end when I was kind of mentioning myself like I don't find myself as compassionate as she would be because I'm not compelled to go out and, and try to save as many animals that's just my character uh, I am so thankful for the fact that there are people like Jordan who have that uh, that drive to help the animals uh, as much as she does and and I love the fact that she's out there teaching people how to care for animals and she's creating products that that help uh, the, you know some of the main problem areas in the hobby. Obviously, stuck shed is a huge common issue because of the poor husband, husbandry that we see all the time. So uh, really, really enjoyed that podcast. Make sure you go check out the show notes for any more information on Jordan. I'll actually post the... Uh, the funny clip of her of her iguana giles uh giving that uh, book a tail whip when she was trying to read so I'll, I'll post that in the show notes as well so you can take a look at that until next time if you are really enjoying the podcast i would definitely appreciate a five-star rating and a review on itunes that definitely would help me out a lot and if you want to go to animals at home.ca slash shop you can find a shirt and five dollars for every shirt is donated to the amazon rainforest conservancy and i will talk to you guys next time